Good morning, church, and welcome to worship. I'm Bill Gabbard, and I serve this congregation here at Second Ponce as Minister of Music. We're happy that you're joining us this morning in worshiping our great God together. We worship him with song, we worship him with prayer, and we worship him by listening to his word, faithfully read and faithfully preached. Join us as we sing together, number 407, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Technology is a great tool, isn't it? Because it's by way of technology that we are able to gather together. Friends, good morning and welcome to worship. We are so happy that you have joined us for worship. We wish you were in the room, but we know that you're watching. And so my friends, get ready. There will be some awesome singing, some amazing preaching today. And friends, I'm excited about it. So in your varied locations, I pray you're excited about it. And so, hey, you didn't come to hear me. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for everything you're doing in our lives. God, you still give us hope even though it's turbulent right now. And so gracious God, help us to focus on you. Shed us of worry and let us worship you today and every day of our life. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, boys and girls. It's good to be with you again for the children's sermon today. Why don't you come a little closer to the screen so it feels more like we're here together in the sanctuary for the children's sermon. You know, today I want to talk to you about wisdom. You know, there was a very wise king in the Old Testament. His name was Solomon, and Solomon was King David's son. And when he first began to serve as the king of God's people, he was a little bit unsure of all the things he should be doing to lead God's people well and with wisdom. So one night when Solomon was sleeping, God appeared to him in a dream and said, Ask me for whatever it is that you want. Now, Solomon could have asked for anything. He could have asked for a long life. He could have asked for riches for the kingdom. He could have asked God for anything. But he didn't. He asked God for wisdom. He asked God for a wise mind and a wise heart that would lead God's people well and do what was right in the sight of the Lord. Solomon was a super wise king because God gave him all the wisdom he could ever want or need to be a great leader. Solomon was able to make the right decisions and to do the right things as a leader. He even built a temple for God's people to go and worship at. It was beautiful and magnificent. Solomon also wrote a book in the Bible called Proverbs that helped people to understand what things were wise in the eyes of the Lord. In the book of Proverbs, one of the Proverbs there says that wisdom comes from God. Solomon asked for wisdom, and God gave it to him freely. 
So boys and girls, there'll be times when you don't know what to do and you don't know which way to go and you don't know what's the right thing or the wrong thing and you may feel a little bit unsure. The Bible also teaches us that when we feel like this, we can ask God for wisdom and he will give it to us freely. In the New Testament, there's a verse that says, If anyone needs wisdom, let him ask, and God will give it freely. So in all the ups and downs and uncertainties of life, especially at this time, you can trust God to give you the wisdom that you need when you ask for it. Let's pray together today. Dear God, thank you so much that you are listening to us and you want us to ask you when we need help, when we need wisdom. Lord, when we are uncertain or we're afraid or we don't know what to do, help us to come to you and ask you to give us the wisdom that we need to do what is right. Lord, I pray for each of these boys and girls. Help them to be bold and courageous and fearless in asking you for wisdom and in doing what is right in the world. Lord, we love you and we thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Would you join me in prayer? God of ages, in your sight, nations rise and fall and pass through times of peril. Now, when our land is troubled, be near to judge and save. May leaders be led by your wisdom. May they search your will and see it clearly. If we have turned from your way, help us to reverse our ways and repent. Give us your light and your truth to guide us through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of this world and our Savior. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the Old Testament book of 1 Kings. I'm reading from chapter 3, verses 5 through 12. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and you've given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, You have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they can't be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to understand, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this, and not asked for yourself a long life or riches, for the life of your enemies, but but you have asked for yourself understanding to do what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. Can you remember at what point it occurred to you that that one of the responsibilities of adulthood is making decisions that impact other people? Well, in our story today, this adult reality uh, hits hits Solomon in one fell swoop. The the accounts vary, but apparently Solomon was between uh, 15, 20 years old when he became king. Uh, And he was a trust fund baby of sorts. I mean, his dad was king, so Solomon grew up in the palace, he ate well, he vacationed well, he used his dad's country club membership. There are biblical hints that he might have been living the undisciplined life of a spoiled playboy. For instance, our scripture today says that Solomon is in Gibeon, which is a cultic site. It's worship on a high place, and worship on a high place is strictly forbidden. It is not the place where good little Jewish boys go to play. But Solomon's a son of the king. It's as though he makes his own rules. And speaking of play, Solomon uh, liked his women, and they didn't need to be Jewish either. Over time, he rounds up multiple wives and concubines, and they are from all over the place. He even marries uh, the Egyptian princess. This life is the son of a king. Fast and free, dad's Amex card, weekends on the boat. And then David dies. And Solomon overnight goes from frat party to throne of the United Empire overnight. Well, this had to be completely overwhelming. Under his father's leadership, the north and south have come together, Israel and Judah 
Solomon inherits this united monarchy, but let's not get too carried away about what united means, right? I mean, it's still a, a, a configuration of tribes, north and south. They're still trying to figure out how, what it means to be one. I mean, for over 200 years, we have been the United States of America, but United doesn't always mean united. It's not always campfires and kumbaya. So this is basically a college freshman who just became king of an unstable nation. And when God visits him in a dream, Solomon is back at Gibeon offering burnt offerings where he shouldn't be. When God appears to him in a dream, and offers Solomon a gift to, to, to help celebrate his new job. Not, not a Mont Blanc pen or a new briefcase. Instead, the Lord says, ask what I should give you. Well, Solomon acknowledges that the Lord was faithful to his father. You showed him great and steadfast love. And Solomon accepts that the divine role of kingship has now been passed on to him. But he says to the Lord, I'm just a kid. I'm only a little child. I have no military experience, how to go out, how to come in. I have no governing experience. I really don't even shave that often. And you've given me charge over a great people more than can be numbered or counted. Solomon is in utter distress over the vortex of this new responsibility that's been put on him for the welfare of other people. And most of us adults know something about what that feels like. I've been praying for our parents in this church over the last week who are right in the middle of that kind of vortex of responsibility some of the parents in our fellowship are having to decide whether or not to send their children back to school this fall. Some, some schools have declared that they're going to be offering in-person schooling. Some schools, like Atlanta Public Schools, have declared there will be no in-person instruction this fall. All of school will be online. Some systems, like Cobb County, are leaving it to parental choice. So do you keep your child home to learn on a screen, miss out with the important uh, development parts of interpersonal interaction? Or do you send your child to bump into dozens of others in the hall with the possibility of being exposed to a deadly virus? Those are big, big responsibilities. Some of our members are expecting the birth of a new baby, which is just so thrilling. But you've got to imagine there's at least a little bit of dose of terror about what that new adult responsibility for somebody else looks like. Some of you have been involved in closed-door meetings about which employees will not have jobs soon. Who's going to need to be furloughed? Who's going to need to be let go? Are, are, are there some offices that we should just close completely? Do we really need the Charlotte office? Those are big responsibilities. And what happens to those who have been working in the Charlotte office? Some of those people are going to have to figure out how to do life in this new current uh, financial reality. One paycheck when the family used to have two or no paychecks? Does our daughter need to quit college and come home now? No insurance means I can't have the surgery right now. Big, big adult responsibilities. In a natural progression, it might would be time that the kids sat down with dad to tell him it's time to look at retirement homes. He's been leaving the stove on. He's been getting lost when he comes back from Target. Now might be the time to look at that transition. But do you transition a loved one into a high-density community during a pandemic? These are big responsibilities. 
Solomon knew that he had just assumed major responsibility and that his decisions would have implications for thousands of people. So when God asked Solomon what he wanted more than anything else, Solomon said, give your servant an understanding mind to govern your people and the ability to discern between good and evil. And God said to Solomon, because you've asked this and didn't ask to live a long time or for personal wealth or for something bad to happen to your enemies, but because you asked for wisdom to discern what is right, I will do as you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning mind. In his awesome responsibility to make decisions that impacted the lives of other people, Solomon prayed for understanding and discernment that he might operate wisely on behalf of other people. Wisdom, it's, it's hokmah in the Old Testament, Sophia in the New Testament, uh, Melissa actually likes the fact that both of these words are uh, feminine. Uh, make of that what you will. But biz- biblical wisdom, hokva, Sophia, is this combination of mental ability and skill and insight and judgment. A wise person in the Bible has the combination of intellect and discernment to thrive. One commentator said that he thinks of wisdom uh, like alignment. You know how how when the car is just out of alignment, you always have to just tug the steering wheel just a little bit against the pull, and if you don't, you'll end up in a tree, right? So he says that the prayer for wisdom is the prayer that our lives will get into alignment with God's will and God's purpose so that we're not pulling off course anymore, that we'll put our soul into alignment with the ways of God. And as you well know, the human will does have a tendency to get out of alignment. In Solomon's awesome responsibility to make decisions that impact other people, Solomon prays for understanding and discernment so that he might make wise decisions for the impact of other people. Well, most of us get a little longer on-ramp to adult responsibility than Solomon did. I mean, one day he's in his late teens, he's hanging out with his buddies, playing catch and going fishing, and the next day he is on the throne of Israel. Most of us get to move a little more gradually into adult responsibility. And most of us have a smaller circle of influence than the whole united monarchy of Israel and Judah. But most of us do make decisions that have impact on the lives of others. And the stress of that is every bit as real. It might be the decision about whether or not to keep your nine-year-old at home this fall or the decision to lay off hundreds from a multinational corporation. But every adult hearing this sermon is called on to make some decisions that impact the lives of others. And when God asked Solomon what he wanted more than anything, what is your greatest wish, Solomon had the humility to ask for an understanding mind to make good choices on behalf of the numerous people in his care. Which strikes me as a wise decision on his part even before he was granted uh, the extra portions of God's wisdom. In the last months, we of a church have been praying together, remotely mostly. On Wednesday nights, we pray together on the phone line. We're praying together at other times. We prayed for recoveries and healings, that the virus spread would lessen, that the city violence would wane. We prayed for racial healing, prayed that we could be a part in that reconciliation process. We have prayed for each other in grief and loss. 
We prayed that we might participate more fully in God's great big love project to redeem the world. But let's add in this season our sincere prayer for wise hearts to make loving decisions on behalf of those people in our care. It is one of the burdens we should regularly be offering up to God. There is a prayer for wisdom that's selfish. That is, Lord, make me wise and cunning and sly so that in my wisdom I might have an advantage. But the prayer for wisdom that we could make good decisions on behalf of others is altogether different. Commentator Thomas Blair says, Wisdom arrives when the soul discerns its destiny, when life aligns in sync with the soul. Wisdom pleases the Lord when it is not self-serving, but other-serving. But the search for wisdom doesn't happen casually. It's, it's not like you're in your motorboat skimming across the surface and you just reach out with a net and snatch a little wisdom on your way. Sophia lives deep under the surface. She lives in the quiet depths. Wisdom invites us, but we've got to take the time to travel into the deep place where she lives to spend time listening, discerning, aligning. But I have every confidence that when we take the time to go deep in the sincere search for wisdom on the behalf of the welfare of others, that it is one of God's great, great delights. May God answer our prayers for wise and discerning hearts in this important time. We close our worship this morning by once again offering our voices to our great God. Join me as we make music for his glory together, sweet hour of prayer. Now go in the way of wisdom, and go in the love of God, and go in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello and welcome to All Together. Listen, we're so excited we're getting ready for worship. We just pray that something is shared that will bless you in this soon coming week. So let's worship.
days may be darkest, but your light is greater. You light our way, God, you light our way. When evil is rising, you're rising higher with power to save, with power to save. And you keep hope alive. You keep hope alive from the beginning to end. Your word never fails. You keep hope alive because you are alive. Jesus, you are alive. Death had a stronghold, but your life was stronger. Rose from the grave, rose up from the grave. When evil is rising, you're rising higher with power to say, with power to say, oh, you keep hope alive, you keep hope alive from the beginning to end, your word never fails, you keep hope alive because you are alive.
shall hide me. One thing have I desired of the Lord. One thing have I desired that I will seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord. To behold your beauty. To inquire in your temple. In the secret of your presence you shall hide. Hey, everybody. I hope you are enjoying worship at the moment, and I pray not to let you nor God down as we continue in worship. We're going to continue today with our last message from our Playlist from the Psalms sermon series. I hope it has blessed you as much as it has blessed us here. I want you to know that, man, the playlist and the soundtrack of the songs that we have listed in Spotify have blessed my soul and I pray that they have encouraged you as well. And so today, we look at volume four from Psalm three. The soundtrack of this psalm is titled, My Morning Prayer. Psalm three, My Morning Prayer. It was William Shakespeare who once said, the earth has music for those who listen. Although at times the music is not always upbeat, sometimes there are some minor chords and even some dissonance along the way. When I lean into that dissonance, I sometimes see that those closest to us sometimes have the capacity to hurt us the most. This occurs due to those who are closest to us knowing just about everything about us. Think about it, best friends, spouses, family members, brothers, sisters, those we deem loved ones can sometimes hurt us to our core. I'm talking about that hard to forgive, skeptical of everyone, hide yourself as a result of type of hurt. But after the hurt takes place, your next steps can build or destroy your character. You can choose to exchange hurt for hurt, or you can choose to go to God about your hurt. I know it is very tempting to exchange hurt for hurt and pain for pain, because in the moment we have what I like to call a sin now and pray later type of mentality, where we want people to feel the pain that we feel. It's tempting. Oh, boy, it is. But it is wrong. See, the unpopular but wise choice of choosing God instead of applying pain to someone's life, even when they deserve it, has the capacity to change our situation, but also us in the process. Friends, I don't know if you've caught this by now, but allow me to tell you, jealous people can hurt people. We see this in Psalm 
23. As Absalom, that's David's son, he will show us today. You see, Absalom is what I would like to classify as an emotionally led individual. You see, previously, if you rewind and play back in the Bible, he killed his brother Amnon because his brother molested his sister Tamar. The pattern of Absalom's life, however, is to feel first and then to act out immediately what he feels. Friends, but how many of us can attest that sometimes in our life, our feelings can get us in a whole world of trouble? If you like that and you know that's true, just type amen. Friends, we find Absalom, however, right here, all up in his feelings. This brother is jealous of his own father, David, because he wants to occupy the seat of king, which David is the king currently. In jealous fashion, Absalom decides to assemble a secret army to go after his father, King David. And my brother David, he is all about his strategic plans. And David says, okay, they're coming after me. I need to pack up and I need to get out of Dodge. <laughs> and so David is running away from his own son. I told you that sometimes those closest to us have the capacity to hurt us the most. Is David hurt? Absolutely. But even in this hurt, he offers us the soundtrack to his life. And the song playing at this moment is from Psalm 3, titled, My Morning Prayer. Listen to David's prayer. David says, O oh Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying, O oh my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. Selah. At the top of the morning, David begins expressing his life situation to God. Friends, David does not begin like many of us to begin our morning as we scroll through social media. David doesn't even begin with a cup of coffee. David <laughs> doesn't even brush his teeth. <laughs> morning breath and all, my brother David, he expresses how his enemies are increasing and how they are plotting against him. These enemies are plotting to overthrow him from his royal seat as king. The adversaries described here, they're led by his very own son, Absalom. David has packed up his household. He's ran away, but even in his running, he stopped and found some sleep along the journey. And as he wakes, as he wakes up, he speaks to the sovereign supervisor saying, God, I don't know if you catch this or not. I don't know if you understand what's happening in my life, but I have more enemies than weapons. I have more problems than solutions. I have more hurt than honor. Yahweh, the formal name of God, if you could provide any help for me in this moment, I need it. At the top of the morning, David honestly and intimately reflects and describes his life situation to God. How do you begin your morning? Personally, I try to begin my morning, most mornings, with prayer. But don't deem me a saint and put me on top of any church because my prayer is quick. This is how it goes. God, thank you for waking me up this morning. Be with me during this day. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> David, when I read Psalm 3, David pushes me. He steps all over my toe and I say, ow. Because David pushes me and tells me, you need to graduate your prayer life, Joshua. <laughs> and I want to tell each of you that we all collectively should graduate our morning prayer life. You want to know why? Because in Psalm 3, we see a model of prayer for our morning prayers. Our morning prayer in verses 1 and 2 teach us that our morning prayer should be honest and intimate with God. See, David, early in the morning, before the sun could peek her head over the horizon, David didn't do anything else, but he told the truth about his life. 
He told the truth and was intimate about his life. My brother David cut beneath the surface. He didn't say, God, you are awesome. Oh, kind, most gracious. No, David said, hey, how you doing, God? Let me tell you this. I have a bunch of enemies rising up against me. My brother David didn't use no flowery language. David offered a true snapshot and synopsis of what was going on in his life and how it affected him. Friends, honesty and intimacy is hard for us. See, many of us maintain the habit of what I like to call keeping others at bay. We like to tell people and reveal to people only what we want them to know about us. It's only what we are comfortable with. Friends, we are proficient at this. I would go so far as to say we have PhDs in keeping others at bay. And what's so bad about this is really toxic, y'all, <laughs> because we keep others at bay so much that that habit spills over into our relationship with God. Friends, we lack intimacy and honesty in our prayer life with God if we tell the truth this evening. Friends, God, however, does not need or want nor desire to be kept at bay. God wants our intimacy. God wants our honesty. God wants to be close to us. And so I give you my first challenge today, and it's simply this. Stop censoring your prayers to God. God is a big God. God can take everything you want to talk to him about. God can take what's bothering you, what's upsetting you, and even that which is plaguing you. God can take what is even ugly about you, what's rising up in you, and even that which is hurting you. David triple dog, I mean triple, triple, triple dog dares us to be honest and intimate in our prayer life with God. Friends, we see that honesty and intimacy, they're key components in our morning prayers, but in all of our prayer life. But yet David continues praying, beginning at verse three, going down to verse four. David says, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me. My glory and the one who lifts my head I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain, Selah. Friends, as we hear David honest and intimate with God, he shares and describes God not as super God, not as savior, not as gracious God. He says, God, you are a shield. Hmm. See, this is quite powerful language used by David because shields are important. See, if a soldier goes to battle without a shield, that soldier has nothing to block him from the weapons of the enemy. In fact, if a soldier doesn't have a shield, he pretty much just goes out the battle and says, all right, I'm right here. Y'all go ahead and kill me now. <laughs> See, a shield in itself is protection. A shield is a barrier that blocks a person strategically from harm, and it actually sustains their life. Friends, we need to learn to ask God to be our shield. See, our morning prayers should, yes, contain honesty and intimacy with God, but our morning prayers should include asking God to be a shield for us. See, having God be a shield of protection, it's a powerful ask. See, let's look, however, at this powerful ask and how a shield is described through Scripture by David. It's in Psalm 5, verse 12, where David wrote, Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with favor as a shield. He talks about favor. That's God's kindness. And God is kind and loves us. How? By protecting us as a shield. But yet, if we fast forward and go over to Psalm 28, verse 7, we're going to see David describe the shield again, saying, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song, I praise him. You see, God has equipped David with strength, but God has fought the battle for David, and because of his shield of protection, David says, I praise you now. 
<laughs> Friends, when we trust God to be a shield of protection for us, we invite God to handle all of the situation. So do you know how powerful it is as you sit on the side of your bed and don't grab your cell phone, but begin to pray to God and say, God, will you be my shield? In essence, when you do that in the morning, you're saying, come what may, <laughs> hit me with your best shot. I don't care what the enemy's tactic may be. I know I serve a terrific God. And you invite God to go before you, to surround you, to come after you and clean up all the mess that any enemy has or opposition could throw or plan against you. This is what David is saying right here in Psalm 3. My brother David is saying, hey man, I got some people coming after me and they are led by my own, my son. It's Absalom. And they're trying to come and throw everything and plot against me. God, I need you to be my shield. <laughs> and friends, we have so much going on right now that I think that prayer is quite applicable to our chaotic world because we need God to be a shield around us. We need God to be a shield of protection to protect our health. We need God to be a shield of protection to protect our finances. We need God to be a shield of protection to protect our family. We need God to be a shield. It's funny because if you look at Psalm 3 and you get the background story of Psalm 3, you understand that yes, Absalom is plotting against his own father. But here's what's so, what blessed me about it this week. David knows it. <laughs> David is not left blind to this. He knows what Absalom is plotting, but yet David focuses on his God. Hmm. See, God answers David's prayer from the holy mountain of Mount Moriah. God proves that he's able to be a shield for David because he's done it before. You see, and so David says, you know what? I look back over my life and I remember God did it back then. I'm gonna trust that he'll do it again. You want to know how David and why David was able to trust in God and not be focused on his enemy right now, Absalom? You want to know why? I'm going to put it in contemporary terms for you. It's because God is the cheat code. <laughs> David knew that God is the cheat code. I know some of y'all saying, now listen, this ain't in the Bible. What are you talking about, Josh? Let me give you a quick story. You see, I was in elementary school and I used to play this game called Mortal Kombat. Me and my friends would gather at my house. Mom, I'm sorry you didn't know about this, but you know now. We would gather at my house after school before we did any of our homework, and we would gather in my room and we would play Mortal Kombat. I had this one friend, his name was Marcel. No matter who went up against Marcel on this video game, Marcel would always beat us. But I noticed that he would always beat us, but before he would play, he would say, y'all go out the room, I need to say a prayer. Well, we would go out the room and all we would hear was Well, one day after I got beat again by Marcel, I came to Marcel, pulled him to the side and I said, hey Marcel, how is it that no matter who you play against, you always beat them? He says, okay, I'm gonna tell you my secret, but if I tell you, you can't tell nobody else. I said, okay, he said, you can't use it against me. I said, okay, Marcel. He said, hey, when my mom goes to the grocery store, I go with her. I said, okay, that's not telling me anything. He says, but when she gets all the groceries that she needs, when we, we go to the cashier, I said, hey, you giving me information I still don't care nothing about. He said, but when I go to the cashier, Year, right by the candy bars, there are these magazines, they're gaming magazines. And if you get these gaming magazines inside of them, they're cheat codes that if you put them inside the game before you play it, they will make you unbeatable no matter who your opponent is. And friends, what I want you to know is that David is telling us the same thing. He's pointing us to the cheat code named God, that no matter who our opponent or our enemy may be, we start our mornings with God honestly and intimately, and guess what? We win. <laughs> when we literally ask God to be our shield, we win. God is the cheat 
code of life by helping us to conquer that which is coming against us. You see, even the, the, the early theologians knew that God was the cheat code. That's why Paul could declare in Romans 8 that nay in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who first loved us. My good brother Paul even knew that God was the cheat code, which is why he told the believers at Philippi that they could do all things through Christ who gave them strength. And so friends, I want you to catch this today. Stop fighting alone. Hmm. <laughs> Stop believing that you have the remedy and the rescue for your problem. Learn to ask God to be a shield. <laughs> Learn to depend on God. Why? Because God is the cheat code. And here's the truth. God is often imitated but never duplicated. <laughs> God is undefeated <laughs> and will never lose. And so, friends, you got the cheat code. It's God. Depend on God. My brother David in Psalm 3 knew this. That's why he says, all these people are running up against me. God be with me. The applicable point right here in verses three and four is this. Yeah, you ask God to be your shield, but you should do it because we ask God for so many other things except really what we should. And that's one for God to be our shield. After the Selah, a nice word that means pause, stop. Let's go again. It's in verses five through eight that we see the last portion of this psalm. David says, I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people, Selah. Our morning prayers, they should be honest and intimate. They should in choose, they should include asking God to be a shield for us. But our morning prayers should include asking God for rest and assurance. See, in the midst of unfair pain, David finds the ability, however, to sleep in the midst of chaos. David is not like you and I. And even if you won't admit to this, I will. When I have a problem, I toss and turn all night. When I have a problem, I, I, I worry about it. When I have a problem, sometimes I even stress eat about it. But yet David is modeling something that we need to learn how to do. David is resting in the midst of the problem. The reason that David could rest is because he says, I fell asleep. Why? Because I know that the Lord sustains me. See, this manufactured army produced by his son Absalom, they're surrounding David at this moment, and yet this brother has just <laughs> woke up. What's so crazy is that the text describes the, the, the amount of men saying it's 10,000s of them. And yet David was slobbing on a rock, wiped his mouth, and prayed to the Lord. <laughs> David delights in the Lord. David is assured by what God has done, and he's trusting that God would keep that same energy. He's trusting that God would provide the victory. Why? Because victory comes from God. Family, I don't know about you, but this thing messed me up. Like I had to put my hand over my eyes. I had to say, okay, I, I, I don't understand this. It was almost like watching Scream 2 and, and I was in the movie. Like I was reading this thing and I'm like, David, brother, these people are surrounding you, bro. They, they like coming to kill you. Like your son is suffering from the jealous disease and you about to die, bro. And David is like, oh, but God is a shield for me. <laughs> the glory and the lift of my head. I said, boy, that's like a Zen master. That's like Phil Jackson on steroids. Like, how are you able to be this calm? And then God told me this. You know why David is able to be this calm? Because God is the one we should cry out to when we experience unfair pain. Hmm. That messed me up. Because if we really survey the Bible and just go to Jesus, that's what Jesus did. He cried out to God in the midst of unfair pain. When he was crucified for the sins of humanity, he cried out to God. 
when he was led to the cross for being exactly who he is, which is the Messiah, the one who saved, Jesus hung there and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. <laughs> When people were making fun out of him and put 72 thorns on the, on the crown of his head and, and, and mocked him saying he was the king of the Jews when in fact he really was, it was unfair. It was unjust. And he was ridiculed for being who he is and who he was sent to be. But yet he says, Father, hmm, into your hand, I commend my spirit. Friends, you got to catch this. Jesus cried out in unfair pain. David cried out in unfair pain. Will you? Because friends, when trouble arises in our life, many of us have what I need to call an, an ounce out right now. We have bad theology. Because we begin to talk about God. Every time we have a problem, we like to think God's against me then. Every time a hate arises up in our life, we say, man, well, you know, God, he, he don't like me like he like you. Friends, you don't have to do anything wrong just because you experience some pain. Friends, there are times in your life where you are going to experience unfair and unjust pain, but that does not mean that God is against you. This is when we must learn to cry out like Jesus did, to cry out like David did and say, God, I need your divine justice in this unjust world and situation. I want you to know that I too experience unfair and unjust pain. Every time that I leave my house, get in my car, before I crank it up and leave my driveway, I have to say, Lord, please let me make it back home the same day I left. I don't pray that prayer just for safety. I pray it also because I'm an African-American man living in America. I shouldn't have to pray that prayer. I should pray it just for safety. But I have to pray it because there are some injustices in this world and some people that may not be nice to me because of the color of my skin. I too experience unjust pain every time I'm out and I get to see a small child with their parents and I have to worry and utter a breath prayer to say, God, please let that child who's in childhood experience adulthood because the world's so messed up that I don't know sometimes if that child would be slain or killed or murdered. That's unfair. It's unjust. But I cry out to God and I choose to because the other extreme is this, to have no hope at all. The other extreme is this, to have no hope at all and to believe that my fear and that my problem is bigger than my God. So David surrounded by an army that was put together by his son teaches me this, that we may be surrounded, but God is still sovereign. We may be surrounded by some unfair pain sometimes in our life, but we still serve a savior. We may experience and be surrounded by some injustices in our life, but guess what? The Lord can still be our shield. And so I challenge you to begin your morning with God and nothing else. Be honest and intimate with God. He deserves it. Ask God to be your shield. You need protection. Ask God for rest, that you can rest in the midst of chaos and be assured that God will fight for you. May the words of Psalm 3 echo all this week and forevermore in your mind. But thou, O Lord, art a shield about us, the glory and the lifter of our head. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for Psalm 3 and David's words. Thank you for the faith that David showed. God, may we cry out to you in the midst of any unjust pain that we may see in our society. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus and the example that Jesus models for us. In the name of Christ, we do pray. Amen. Friends, if you are there right now and you do not know Jesus, I want to invite you to a party that's better than any earthly party you will experience. And it's a party where your savior is right there with you. If you don't know Jesus right now, and you've never accepted him into your heart, you can 
right where you are. All you have to do is pray this prayer with me. Say, I admit that I'm a sinner in need of God's love. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. And I confess that Jesus is the Lord of my life. If you've prayed that prayer, I want you to do me and yourself a favor. Let us know about it. You can email me at jscott at spdl.org. And we want to celebrate you and celebrate everything that God is doing in your life. But you could be watching from wherever you may be. And you may feel as though, hey, I want to connect with Second Punch. Hey, we want to connect with you too. And so friends, if you want more information and you don't find it on our website and you need to email me, hey, go ahead. But if you want to look on our great website, it's spdl.org. Feel free to let us know if you have any prayer requests or if you would like to sow into this ministry financially. There's an option to give there. It's no pressure. But if God is stirring in your heart, we would love it if you would. Friends, today as we prepare to leave, the together takeaway is this. You heard it already. God is the one we should cry out to as we experience unfair pain. The world's not perfect and neither are we. But guess what? David has given us a good soundtrack to listen to. And so I pray and hope that you have enjoyed this sermon series. It blessed me. I pray it blessed you. I have two more songs that I want to add to our playlist that can be found on Spotify. And if you need the link, it's on all the social media sites. And it is this. The two songs I have, one is Something Has to Break by Kiara Sheard and Tasha Cobbs Leonard. It's a great song, man. And the next one is You Get the Glory by Jonathan Trailer. Something Has to Break, You Get the Glory. Rotate that on your playlist. Be encouraged. And when you see unfair pain, don't lose hope. Keep crying out to God about it. Have a great week. <laughs>